Is that better? Can you? Ah, no. Brilliant. I can see myself. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, I'm good. If <laughs> you can see me and hear me, that's brilliant. <laughs> well, welcome everyone from all over the world. It's fantastic to see all those flaggy things, all those points on the map. Lovely. Thank you very much for coming um, and for being interested in listening to me talk about future books. Um, let me just get myself together. So, um, my sc I have to do this on my laptop. So I haven't got a lot of space. I can't see a lot of your comments. So I won't be able to take much notice of them as I talk. But um, Caroline will um, um, be taking notes of some of the questions. If you have some at the end, hopefully there'll be 10 minutes for me to answer them. Um, so let's start. Um, my talk today is about picture books in ELT. And the aim of my session is to help you reconsider or encourage you to reconsider some of the potential for picture books um, in, in our classrooms. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of picture book anatomy, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about the pictures in the picture book and the words in the picture book and how they come together. And then I'm going to look at three picture books by um, by Emily Gravitt, okay, and I've chosen these three in particular because they show picture books for um, a wide range of ages, from preschool right the way up to secondary, okay. Um, so, do you use picture books in your English classes? That's the first poll. Um, we just want a yes or a no. So let's say A is yes and B is no. Do you want to just sort of give me an idea of how many of you use picture books in your classes? Well, so far that's everyone. One or two don't, that's fine. Hopefully after today, um, those who don't yet might start. Okay, lovely. So, so far we have 17 of our 140 participants, 18 maybe, um, who use picture books in the classroom, okay? Um, and five say they don't. That, that's only a small percentage of it, but that's okay. Just gives me an idea. Thank you. Right. Um, what I'd like to start with really is to emphasize the authenticity of picture books. Um, and to give you some definitions. Um, what's important about picture books is that they're made by real artists in search of creating real meaning, and whether they're aware of it or not, they represent the culture that they come from. And the words are unabridged examples of real language containing natural rhythm, onomatopoeia, and alliteration. Well, my favorite definition of a picture book comes from a lady called Barbara Bader, who's an American, um, and she writes, a picture book is text, illustrations, total design, an item of manufacture and a commercial product, a social, cultural and historical document and foremost an experience for a reader or beholder. For some reason my screen keeps doing strange things. Um, I'm just going to stop a second. Caroline, are you sending things to me? Because I keep getting messages saying select start sharing to start something. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. I seem to have calmed down now. I don't have this message. Okay. So um, this is the definition. This is the definition of of a picture book that I'd like us all to to consider. And 
I'm sorry, Caroline. I'm I'm uh, my um, screen keeps disappearing. What should I do? One moment, everyone. If you could just stay with me, I'll just see what Caroline tells me to do because there's something wrong with, with hey everybody. The screen. Just bear with me a moment. Hey everybody. Just bear with me a moment. I'm trying to work out why it's trying to share I'm the screen. I'm trying to work out why it's trying to share the screen. If you're receiving yeah. a Is that prompt, to everyone? Just if you're receiving a prompt to download your to, to download, download the handout, your, if, you can, download download handout, if you can just click OK to download the handout, if you can just click OK to download the handout. For some reason, it's trying to dance, send you the handout. For some reason, it's trying to dance, send you the handout. <sighs> Sorry about this, Sandy. I'm not sure what it's doing yet. It's okay. It's not just me. That's me. <laughs> no, it's not you. No, it's not you. Okay, we've still got a few. <laughs> okay, we've still got a few. Everybody accepted the. Everybody accepted the. Handout. Hand out. Oh, it looks like it's it really calm down now. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to turn my mic off so again. Just a point about the I'm going to turn my mic off again. Okay. okay. No, it's doing it all over again. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Is there any way we can stop the handout going out? Well, it seems to have calmed down. Okay. I'll try and continue. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Sandy, can you make sure that at the top? Can you get Sandy? Can you make sure that at the top? Uh, there are three options. There's the yeah. whiteboard, which has got the pen uh, there are with three the red options. Line. There's the whiteboard, which has got the pen with the red squiggly line. Yeah. Make sure that you're clicked on that. You make sure that you're clicked on that. Because it keeps I going to that. application sharing, which it shouldn't it be. It keeps going to application sharing, which it shouldn't be. Oh, like that, see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Caroline, it says I have to select start sharing. Am I supposed to do that? No, no. No, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very strange. Everyone's been very patient, sitting quietly. <laughs> Oh, 
Islam. So it you think have we resolved the problem? I think that's sorted it now. I think that's sorted it now. Oh brilliant. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> Sorry Apologies about that. everybody. Apologies okay. <laughs> <Apologies, everybody. laughs> okay. Right. So <laughs> I was telling you about definitions of picture books. But what's it, what the, the point I want to get across really is that a picture book is made of pictures and words and design brings it all together. And it's the relationship between all these parts which um, are crucial to the understanding of many picture books um, and possibly something which we don't make the most of in ERP. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit therefore about that anatomy of uh, anatomy of um, picture books. And to start with, I'd just like you to think or to guess, if you don't know, how many pages does a picture book usually have? So um, 12, 32, 50, or 100? Uh, a 32 shouldn't be there. <laughs> okay, there's a big 32 there, so you know the answer. So that's very silly. Um, that was supposed to come in as a click, but obviously it doesn't. Um, okay, yes. A picture book has 32 pages, and let me explain why. Um, if you take a piece of paper and you fold it into half three times, one, two, three, what happens is you're left with um, eight folds on one side and eight folds on another. Now, this is the equivalent of a sh uh, what they call a signature, which goes into the printing press. And it represents eight sides of paper of um, page on this side and eight on this side, which makes 16. And the publisher will then cut their 16 uh, their uh, page into four. So you get four pieces of four quarters. You put them together and you get um, 16 pages. Okay. And a picture book is made of two sets of these 16 pages. Right. Um, occasionally you'll get a picture book which is made of 16 plus 8, which is half a signature, or 32 plus 8, which is, um, again, um, um, a whole, two signatures plus half. But the norm for a picture book is 32 pages. Okay. Um, right. So let's have a look then at how a picture book is put together. Um, we have the front and back covers, of course, and then we have what's called the front matter and the back matter, which can be between three and five pages. And then we have the body of the book, which is between 27 to 29 pages. And if you put those all together, you get 32 pages. Sorry, clicking on the wrong thing. So um, the front and back covers the dust jacket, which is um, a cover which um, goes, this is a dust, dust jacket, here we go. It's the cover which some hardback books are covered in, okay, like this. It's a dust jacket because it's supposed to um, um, keep the dust off the book, okay. End papers, which are... Um, in a hardback book, this is a hardback book, okay. End papers actually serve a very important purpose. Um, they are the pieces of paper which are attached to the cover and which join the book to the to the hardback, to the hard cover. Okay? Uh, these are the, in this book you can see that the end papers are red. Right? Okay. There are, there's always a, a front end paper and a back end paper. Okay? Now, um, there are half title and title pages, and I'll show you the example of those in a minute, and there are copyright and dedication pages. Okay? 
And all of these in picture books are often made use of. So um, you, you, in a way, you can think of the illustrations and the words in the body of the book begin to overflow. And um, there's a lot of um, narrative meaning that can be found in these parts of the picture book. Okay? Um, and precisely because of this, it's important to understand the picture book anatomy so that we can see um, what an illustrator is trying to do with the pictures to help us understand the narrative in the picture book. So let's just have a look at a couple of examples. This is a picture book um, by Emily Gravis. I'm featuring only Macmillan picture books in my talk today because this is um, organized by Macmillan, Macmillan children's picture books. And um, this is one of my favorite um, picture books. And if you can look at, if you can see my handout, you can see I've got a link to my blog where you can see what I've written about this picture book. Um, and this is the cover, the front cover. Okay. Well, I'm going to look now at the end papers, which show three little pigs chasing a, a wolf. Okay. Now, already, I'm just going to go back again. Here we go. Wolf won't bite by Emily Gravitt. We've got three little pigs. If we, turn, if we open the book, we can see the three little pigs that we saw on the front cover chasing a wolf. This is the title page, which shows us the title of the um, picture book. Um, and you can see it here. Okay, Wolf won't bite. You can also see Emily Gravitt's name and Macmillan Children's books, which is the name of the publisher. That information has to be on, on the title page of all picture books. But you can also see that we're not just shown the title and the name of the publisher and the illustrator author. We're actually being shown that these little pigs are pushing up a poster, announcing, look, three pigs proudly present. And there are more posters here being carried by this little pig. Okay, so um, possibly they're preparing a show. Maybe they're going to show us something to do with um, a wolf. You can see the three little pigs here on the poster sitting on the wolf. If we turn the page to the, the actual body of the picture book, you'll see that here we have the story, roll up, roll up, roll up. We have caught a wild wolf and the story will begin. Okay? I'm not going to tell you the rest of this story, but it's just for you to see how the peritext, the front cover, and um, the end papers, and the title page are actually contributing to this story. It's the setup of what's happening. Let's have a look at another well-known picture book, The Gruffalo, that many of you will know. Um, about a little mouse who goes walking in a wood. So let's open it up and see inside. These are the end papers. So this is the wood where the story takes place. And we have the title page once again. We have the title of the book. We have the name of the author, the name of the illustrator, and we have the name of the publisher. And we have a little circular um, illustration here. It's got a, a plastic cover on it because there was also a CD in here. But we can see there's a focus on a little mouse. And if we turn the page, we will see that the story begins. And it's, I can't read the words there, but it says, a mouse took a stroll through the deep, dark wood. So the um, title page there was also introducing the main character of the story. Okay. So um, these parts of the picture book are actually very important. And um, Sight has actually said skipping the cover and title page is like arriving at the opera after the overture. And I would like to say that skipping the peritext of a picture book is rather like arriving at the opera after the overture. So we should be using these parts of the picture book um, when we share them with our children. And if someone's just written up there, good point. Yeah, absolutely, good point. <laughs> Please remember it. <laughs> Okay, so let's just have a look then at covers and what we can um, think about when we're showing them to children. Well, we can think, is it one whole illustration? So does the front and the back cover come together to make one whole picture? Do the illustrations give us any important information? Or what do the illustrations on the front cover tell us about what's coming inside? What does the blurb say? Often on the back of the picture book there's some blurb, and for older children that can be quite interesting. And how about barcodes? Sometimes they're um, entertaining. So let's have a look. Here's a picture book by, again, Emily Gravitt. It's called The Blue Chameleon. Um, and I'm showing you the front and the back here because the back's quite interesting. We have um, blue, crossed out, spotty, crossed out, yellow, crossed out, chameleon. 
So I wonder why, um, just a minute, I've got my cat on my lap and he's playing with my scarf, so I'm just going to say, there's my cat, bye-bye everyone. Off you go, cat. There you go. <laughs> so, um, why has the um, illustrator done that? Possibly because it lets us know that inside the chameleon is going to change from being blue to spotted to yellow. Maybe it's giving us clues. Have a look at another one. Here's the front and back cover of Wolf Won't Bite, which I showed you before. And you can see the front cover was the three little pigs. The back cover was the, the wolf that they were trying to tame. So that, 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 and again, it's a whole illustration. It's nice joined there by the, um, by the, the lead which they've got on, on the, the, around the wolf's neck. Um, a squish and a squeeze by, again, by um, Julia Donaldson and Alex Schaefer. The front cover shows the main character, which is a little old lady who's, who lives in a house that's far too small. And so she asks this gentleman here what she should do. And he tells her that she should fill it with animals. And that's when she realizes, in actual fact, when she sends all the animals out, her house is quite big after all. Um, again, another one by Donaldson and Scheffler, a Room on the Broom. And we have the main characters on the front here. And then here we have the dragon, who's the baddie in the picture, and appears towards the end. And we also have some nice bumps, which, if we read it, um, gives us a little bit of information about what will, come, what will be coming in the story. The witch had a cat and a very tall hat, and long ginger hair, which she wore in a plait. How the cat purred and how the witch grinned as they sat on their broomstick and flew through the wind. And another nice thing that you can see on um, the back of picture books are often um, reviews. And here we have one here, and it says, Julia Donaldson and Alex Scheffler have come up with another gem. We loved it. And some of these you know, reviews, this information, can be used with older children in particular. And later, after reading a picture book, you can actually ask children what they would write on the back of the picture book if they were, were able to. So any papers, again, um, those important um, pieces inside the covers that keep the book together. They can be blank, they can be colored, they can be illustrated, they can be the same, or they can be different at the front and the back. And how are they different? So let's just have a look at some examples. This is from, um, these are the end papers from Room on the Broom here. And they actually just show the four things which fall off the witch as she's flying. Her hat, her wand, her broom breaks and she falls down, and her ribbon in her hair. Um, so it's just little um, bits of information there, which, which visual information, which the, the end papers have picked up on. This is from a lovely book called The Haunted House, again, another Macmillan picture book, by a Japanese um, illustrator. And the f um, these are the back end papers. Now, unfortunately, I've put the front end papers underneath, and I thought I could click and make them appear, but I can't. So that doesn't, but the front end papers are, um, Orange. My presentation is not going to work very well because I have multiple pictures on each page and I, on each slide, and I hadn't realised I couldn't use them. Okay. Um, again, this is another lovely picture book where, um, by Emily Gravitt, and this is the end, the back end paper. The front end paper shows a very sad. Um, can you see a very sad? Um, looking chameleon, and as the story um, progresses, he eventually meets a friend, and and they turn multicolored. And here we have in the back end papers we have them multicolored. So in in these kinds of picture books, we're seeing a beginning, and then we're shown an end through the end papers, and so they're important to show to children. You can also actually look at dedications to um, dogs. By Emily Gravett. Where did I put that one? Here somewhere. Here we go. Dogs by Emily Gravett again. And this is a wonderful little illustration that she's made out of the um, on the copyright page and the dedication there. Okay. And it might seem trivial, but it's still an image which the children will see and will be interested in, and that we can show them. And of course, we can see here this dedication is for Ellie. Yes, it's a bone. The title page again. I've mentioned that it's always got information about the title. It should always have the publisher and the um, author illustrator. Um, and here we're seeing that the title page is presenting the little girl and her monkey. Okay, and you also have another little dedication here. 
another title page from the smartest giant in town, which um, now I'm modeling six of it here. There you go. Which um, we can see that we've been introduced to the, the giant. And on the cover, we can only see his legs because he's enormous. But here on the title page, we're shown um, a very sad-looking giant, which is in contrast to the title, which says the smartest giant in town. So it leaves us wondering exactly what's going to happen to this giant. He looks very sad in bedraggled clothes. But it's the beginning of the story. So what's important? Um, so now I've, I've, I hope you've explained a little bit about the um, anatomy of the picture book and the importance of considering um, considering um, the, the pretextual features of the picture book. Now I'd just like to talk a little bit about the pictures and words, and I, I, I like to think of pictures and words as running along a continuum where um, pictures and words show and tell similar information. Um, and, they fall, and they fall at the simple end of the continuum. And there can be pictures and words which um, show and tell different bits of information, and so they fall at the more complex end of the continuum. When pictures and words show and tell different things, they tend to leave spaces, gaps, which children can fill with by interpreting what the two things um, do when they come together. And so that's quite a complex um, activity and an important, um, an important aspect of using picture books, in particular with older learners. So picture books at the simple end of the continuum tend to be the picture books that we choose in primary ELT. We, um, we select picture books where the illustrations synchronize with the words. That means that they show and tell. The pictures show pretty much what the words tell. Uh, they might show some extra little bits of information, but generally they support what the words are saying, and they are supportive for the learners and help them understand what's going on. The illustrations tend to be pleasing, and the words, or the verbal text, is predictable, repetitive, and it's cumulative, and it helps. Um, it helps children pick up the language, pick up chunks of the language that they are hearing through the story. The picture books at this simple end tend to be concept books, so they'll, they'll be books about clothes, books about um, parts of the body. The Gruffalo in particular is a picture book that's often chosen um, in primary ELT, precisely because of the um, body parts which it it talks about and the rhyming text that it contains that makes it easy for children to pick up and and, and for children to understand what's going on. Um, so it, these kind of picture books provide a secure, supportive learning context for children. Picture books that are not normally selected for ELT tend to contain pictures and words which show and tell different things, which often pictures which expand upon the words and even contradict at times. Um, illustrations are very sophisticated in these kinds of picture books and allow for lots of different interpretation and thinking. And the um, vocabulary tends to be far richer in terms of um, uh, of content, um, longer, more exciting words, and not necessarily predictable, repetitive, or cumulative. And the themes in these picture books can be much more challenging as well and don't tend to to remain within the, the, the concept um, um, themes. And naturally, because of these uh, elements, they are more challenging for children and therefore much more useful in particular for the older age range uh, of students. So let's just have a look then at a picture of it with smaller kids. It's called Monkey and Me and it's by Emily Gravitt. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to see it properly because, um, because of the way I've set up the slides. But let's see what we can do. I hope we can. Um, how do the, as we um, see the picture book, how do the illustrations help the, the look of the person, the beholder, predict what comes next? Okay, so if, if we can't see it, then maybe I can show you the book. We'll see. So, Monkey and Me. No. <laughs> uh, I've layered my um, illustrations, I've layered my scans, and I hadn't realized I couldn't do that. Um, so here we go, end papers, the title page, which you've seen already, okay. 
And here it is. I hope you can see that. And it says, monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we're off to sea, we're off to sea. And what are we off to see? We're off to see penguins. Okay? You might have noticed that the little girl was walking a little bit like a penguin. So, now we're going onto this one here. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see, we went to see. Now, what do you think she went to see? Any ideas? Mm. <laughs> I can't remember which multiple slides I used. She went um, to see. Here we go, I'll put it back. I'm so sorry, everyone. I hadn't realized this would happen. Here we go. She went to see kangaroos. Did you guess? <laughs> okay. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me. We went to see, we went to see. Can you guess what she went to see? Something that liked hanging upside down? Hanging upside down, possibly a spider. It's that. Okay. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me. We went to see. We went to see, what did she go and see, do you think? What do you think? Elephants, well done, yeah. There we go, elephants. Lovely, you can see the nice big word, elephants, there. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see, we went to see. What do you think she went to see? <laughs> Monkeys. Okay. Monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see. Just a minute, sorry. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me. We went to home for tea. And here she is, having a snooze. And there's a lovely little picture here, which she's drawn, which shows the animal she saw. And the end papers, you can see them here on the screen, show the animals that she found, or that she found, that she went to see. The penguin, the kangaroo, elephant, monkey, and just here we can see two bats hanging from their tails. Okay. It's a very sweet little story. Yes, very lovely. So I asked you, I hope I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but I asked you if you were um what you what the pictures were um how the pictures helped you predict what was coming next. Well, the, the visual text was very repetitive, so we had the little girl imitating the animal that was coming next, um, and then we saw the animal. And we had, again, the little girl imitating, so the visual text was very repetitive, and that allowed for prediction, which is very important. The verbal text was also very repetitive, the monkey and me, monkey and me. And the large font on those spreads that, where the animals were also supports children's emergent literacy, that is, they're able to um, see that a word is representing a concept in that sense, elephants or monkeys or bats, and they're beginning, and they can begin to correlate b bats for the b um, um, shape that they can see at the beginning of bats. So what you should do as, 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 as you are mediating this is to encourage children to chant along with you, to predict what will come next, and on the back end papers in particular to label those um, animals which they saw. Okay. And then you can play um, a fun game where the children imitate the, the child's mimes from the book. And you could also ask them to think about other animals that they could mime and use the chant, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see, we went to see some snakes, for example. Okay? Uh, and you would probably use this picture book with, um, with um, a group of children who were learning about animals in the zoo. Okay? But, um, <laughs> a picture book for bigger kids. Oh, I can't remember how I've formatted this one. So, what do you think will be in a picture book with this kind of verbal text? Um, have a quick read of what you can see on the screen, okay? And then just write what you think um, in the chat box. Write what you think might appear um, in this picture book. What kind of picture book is it? What kind of pictures will it have? Not very appealing, okay. <laughs> it's a non-fiction book, right? Okay, it's going to be about wolves. Possibly we'll see real photos. 
something very out of the box, okay. Right. Okay, so it's a, a factual text about wolves. We might find forests, the environment they live in. Okay, thank you very much. So now I'm going to show you the picture book. I'm not sure how it's going to work because, um, again, I think I've over met, I've layered some of the illustrations. So this is the, um, but let's see. <laughs> and while you um, look at the pictures um, and listen to the, to the um, story, um, think about what the words are telling you and the pictures are showing you. Okay, so think about what the words are telling you and the pictures are showing you. So here we have the cover, Wolves by Emily Gravitt, and this is an award-winning picture book. Here we have the back cover, and we can see um, lots of lovely um, reviews. And this one in particular here at the bottom is a funny one because it says it's a rip-roaring tale and tail is spelled instead of T-A-L-E, but T-A-I-L. And it's from the newspaper called The Herald instead of The Herald. So there's some fun little jokes there that um, older learners can pick up on. Wolves. OK, it yeah, doesn't work. I apologize, everyone. So these are the end papers, which, if you look closely, are sort of Brown with little scratchy marks on them. Okay. The um, title page is like a doormat, and we have what looks like a flyer from the library saying "Wolves" by Emily Grabitz. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. And here we go. Let me see if I can find. This. Rabbit went to the library. He chose a book about wolves. <laughs> this is the front of Rabbit's book, and as you can see, it's just like a library book with library stamps and little library card. Okay. Grey wolves live in packs of between two and ten animals. Let's see where we come here. They can survive almost anywhere between the Arctic Circle to the outskirts of villages and towns. And here we have the wolf, the, the rabbit walking past a town, and the wolf has come out of the book. And he is looking at the rabbit. Okay, then the page that you can see on the screen. In some areas, wolves have retreated to places where fewer people live, such as forests and woodland. They have sharp claws. You can see there the claws of the wolf, and the rabbit is walking past them. He's unaware of them. Long, bushy tails walking up the wolf's tail, and dense fur, which harbors fleas and ticks. And you can see them sticking about there. An adult wolf has 40, 42 teeth. Its jaws are twice as powerful as those of a large dog. Hmm. Wolves eat mainly meat. They hunt large prey such as deer, bison, and moose. They also enjoy smaller mammals like beavers, voles, and rabbits. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> God, I can see you saying, let's see, I'm not sure if this will come up. No, no. Okay. Then there's a, a little bit of information here which says, the author would like to point out that no rabbits were eaten during the making of this book. It's a work of fiction. And so for more sensitive readers, here is an alternative ending. <laughs> yeah, very funny. <laughs> here we go. I apologise that you can't see this beautifully on the screen. Luckily, the wolf was a vegetarian. So they shared a jam sandwich and became the best of friends and lived happily ever after. <laughs> okay. And then we find another illustration of the rabbit doormat. And you can actually open some of these um, um, envelopes and have a look at some of the illustrations on the envelopes, which are beautiful here. Look, G Rabbit, Lane's End Burrow, some wonderful stamps of, of, of um, hairs um, and some great names and things. Jack O'Hare sent that letter. Okay. <laughs> and if you open an end the envelope, which is inside that um, um, the illustration, there's a letter from the public library and saying that the book is delivered due and he has a fine of £10.93 to pay. <laughs> These are the end papers, which you saw at the front as well, but you can see them very well because I showed them in the book. And the back of the book, which is red, very appropriate. Okay. So, we read a factual book about wolves which you all thought it probably would be. But what did we see? We saw a rabbit uh, go to the library, taking out a book and reading that book. And then you saw a real live wolf walk out of the book and eat a real live rabbit for dinner. Um, so the pictures did very different things to the words. And um, I like to call this picture book um, a, a one plus one equals three picture book, precisely because there are three different texts in this picture book. There's the visual, the pictures, there's the verbal, the words, and there's the text which we construct as readers when we put those two together. And I mean, there were several of you, um, there were several of you making comments. I mean, it was very funny, it was humorous, and children can understand the text, the the, visual, the verbal text, and by looking at the pictures, they they are filling the gaps and putting the things together, putting the, the two things together to make another story, a very entertaining one, and one which is very appropriate for slightly older learners. Yes, it is. It's very postmodern, Christina. <laughs> yes, it's an example of a postmodern picture book, and that's for another talk, I'm afraid. But um, very appropriate for our ELT primary learners. Um, okay. So when would we use a picture book like this in class? Well, possibly when we're learning about animals and their habitats. Before doing or after a clear unit which looks at the food chain or carnivores or herbivores or something like that. But um, they, the, if you wanted the children to use the verbal text, the words as a support, they could write descriptions of animals and illustrate them for a display or a class book. Um, but more than anything, this book is for entertainment, so sharing this kind of picture book with your students, to enjoy the, the visual verbal jokes which we saw together just now is a socially enriching experience and one which is also important for language learning and I think we forget about that. So um, this kind of picture book um, is a lovely experience uh, in a classroom. Okay. And a final book about slightly older learners, um, for slightly older learners, is A Little Mouse's Big Book of Fears. Um, okay. So you could ask your students, do you have any phobias? And I would use this picture book with um, older learners sort of in their teens. Um, we could talk a little bit about phobias. We could ask students to go and, and investigate some interesting phobias for their homework and come into the class with them. But um, this was supposed to be a poll, but of course because my slide um, clicking doesn't work, um, if you have musophobia, <laughs> what are you afraid of? Heights, dogs, knives, mice, or insects? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is already there. It's mice, okay? But um, um, 
what I want you to do with this picture book is, as you listen and look, um, can you discover which of the phobias is a made-up phobia? Okay. <laughs> yeah, mice, number four. <laughs> okay. So, Little Mouse's big book of fears. There's a lovely hole there that um, you can put your finger in. <laughs> Let's see, these are the end papers. Okay. And if you go back to these, um, to these end papers, which again is something uh, I didn't mention before, but the repetition, the repeated reading of these picture books is very important because children take, and, and adults too, take quite a long time to see everything. And upon repeated readings, children will re-see or, or, or see things they haven't noticed before and make connections that they haven't made before because of what they've seen. So it's very important to read um, picture books more than once, often three, four times. With small children, many more times than that. Anyway, so these are the end papers, and there's a. Um, I've focused on the piece of paper that was in there, and it says, "Everyone is scared of something. Living with fear can make even the bravest person feel small." Emily Gravitt, Big Book of Fear is the essential book to help you overcome your phobias. It has been put together by an expert in worrying who draws on a lifetime's experience of managing her fear through the medium of a doodle. You too can overcome your fear through the use of art. Each page in this book provides a large blank space for you to record and face your fear using a combination of drawing, writing, collage. Remember, a fear face is a fear defeated. I'm going to go back and for you to see that you might now notice the mouse who's dragging a pencil. And possibly because this mouse is going to try and do what Emily Gravitt has asked him to do. Okay? So here's the title page, and we have all this lovely um, <laughs> the mouse has been nibbling all sorts of things. So I'm going to read the fears out to you, and I think you can probably see what's written on the page. I'm just going to let you look. Okay? So arachnophobia, fear of spiders, entomophobia. Fear of insects. As we can see, here's the mouse doing what Emily Gravitt asked him to do, making notes, writing his fears. There's a tiny little bit of text here. You can't see it here and here. And it says, use the space below to record your fears. Okay, so this is what the little mouse is doing. He's recording his fears. Teratophobia, fear of monsters. Clearophobia, fear of going to bed. Eichmophobia, fear of knives. <laughs> We've got thing. I get edgy near sharp knives. And here's a wonderful cutout of a newspaper, which if you look closely you can then turn the flap, you can see it's the story of um, a farm, a farmer's wife who cuts off the tails of some mice. And we have a traditional tidyphobia. <laughs> we have a traditional rhyme in, in English, which is three blind mice, three blind mice, see how you run. I don't know if you know it, but it's an intertextual reference here to that. Okay. Distichophobia, fear of accidents. I'm not sure I'm saying this properly. And rupophobia, fear of dirt. And this is lovely because the poor little mouse has actually wet himself here. <laughs> He suffers from the fear of knives, yeah. Ligrophobia, the ligirophobia, the fear of loud noises, and chronomentrophobia, the fear of clocks. Again, we have a, a, a rhyme, hickory dickory dock in English, and, and of course this is referring to that rhyme. Children's rhyme. <laughs> Isolophobia, fear of solitude. Where am I phobia? Fear of getting lost. Acrophobia. Fear of heights. And this is actually a map which you can open up. And you have a wonderful map of an island. And it's, funnily enough, in the shape of a mouse. And there are all sorts of interesting. This is East Fright here. And this is North Fright and South Fright. And there are, here we can, this place is called Fast Heart. This is dry throat. <laughs> so all sorts of interesting um, 
um, the scriptures there to look at. Okay. Ornithobia, fear of birds. Phagophobia, fear of being eaten. Cynophobia, fear of dogs. Ailurophobia, fear of cats. And we can turn the picture there of the dog and you can see I'm petrified of cats. Panophobia, fear of everything. Skiophobia, fear of shadows. I'm just going to read the words that are written on there. I'm afraid of nearly everything I see, but even though I'm very small, she's afraid of me. Lucophobia, fear of mice. <laughs> and if you turn to the back end papers, you will see that the little mouse is no longer afraid of anything. He's got little drawings here. This is a big monster mouse and a tiny, tiny spider going eek. So he's got rid of his fear of, of um, insects. And here he's declaring war against a, a cat. He's got a very sharp sword, so he's got, out of, got over his fear of swords and of cats. Okay? And he's sleeping happily with a pencil that's been nibbled right down as he's been going through the book. Okay? So here again we've got end papers which show you the beginning of the story, the challenge, and they show you the end of the story which is the mouse who's managed to do the challenge, who's filled the pages full of sketches and has overcome all his phobias. And this is the back of the book and a wonderful uh, barcode here. <laughs> so we could discuss phobias with the students in our classroom. Which one was probably made up? Can you, did you pick up on it? It was the where am I phobia, <laughs> which is the made up one. Look at the picture again, look closely at the pages with flaps and the extensions. What do the students know about the rhyme, the three blind mice? What, what is the Isle of Fright, um, which is the map that we saw there, okay. You could also look at um, the phobias and how much we know about Greek or Latin, okay. And discuss, some discussion plots which I got off the ESLdiscussions.com website, the, the um, PDF a link is on the handout. What's the difference between a phobia and a fear? Do you have any phobias? How can someone confront and overcome a phobia? Are all phobias irrational? Um, the where am I phobias if you're getting lost? Can you think of any other made up phobias? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so all sorts of different, um, and an and interesting one also to talk about with your students are people in your country xenophobic. Okay, so use this book to talk about phobias. So, um, Yes, it's a good idea for discussion at the lesson. And for older students, you know, in their teens, um, um, very, very, very good. And once again, important to go back to it because there are things that they're going to want to look at. And leave the book, and if, you have, if you're able to have lots of copies of the book, which is great. But if not, leave the book in the classroom so that they can browse through it and have a look. Okay? So the picture book is a unique literary experience um, where meaning is generated. Simultaneous from written text, visual image, and overall design. I hope I've got that across to you. And it's possible to use picture books with all ages of students, not just with the children. They provide authentic, appropriate learning affordances for our students, young and old. And we should be more aware of how picture books reveal their message and present this message to our students as an object with an, sorry, to present the picture books to our students as an object with a message to be discovered and talked about together. Okay. Um, and you can buy picture books. I saw several people asking about questions there. You can buy picture books very cheaply online. Again, I've put the links on the handout, but they're also here on the um, on the PowerPoint. Okay. Book Depository sends books to many countries in the world with, uh, without having to cover the post and package. So it's just the price of the book. And Amazon.co.uk if you're based in Europe. Amazon.com the America if you're South America or um, Asia, possibly, it's easy for you to get um, books from Amazon.com. They have a second-hand market which you can buy very cheap books for. And of course, you have to pay for the postage, but it's not always that expensive. Okay. Please do visit my blog um, where I talk about um, these picture books and many others and um, share what I think about the visual and the verbal. 
And um, if you have any questions, maybe we can look at some of them now. Um, I don't have any questions here from from Caroline. Uh, Sandy, what? That's what PP classes as an animation. Uh, any questions? <laughs> no? Right. <coughs> we got no questions, Sam. No any questions? Ah. Have we got no questions, Sam? Okay, we have one. <laughs> You're How do you adapt text to different ages? Okay, well, um, it's not really a case of adapting text for different ages, it's selecting the appropriate picture book for different ages. So the three picture books I showed you could not be used with the same age group. Um, so the first picture book would be used with primary, or with um, preschool children, um, and the second one with possibly upper primary, and the third one with secondary. Um, is that what you, is that answered your question? <laughs> so it's a case of selecting the appropriate picture book. Precisely because um, the words are authentic, it's, it's a good idea to try and stick to what's written on the page as you tell the story. Um, they've been written like that because they sound good, good they, they flow, and, um, and it's an important part of the picture book. Okay. Any other questions? Has someone said they enjoyed the session? That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> I always enjoy sharing. Um, and, oh, any titles good for... I'm finding it really difficult reading. Ah, okay. Any titles for adults, someone said. Well, the, um, there are lots of really interesting titles for adults. Um, although I'm not aware of that many published by Macmillan, um, who have a wonderful selection of picture books. Um, the um, Little Mouse's Book of Fears, Big Book of Fears, which I showed you last, that actually could be used with adults very easily. Um, and wolves, no, not really. Um, there are some interesting, almost graphic novel-like picture books, and an author called and um, called Sean Tan, but he is not. Um, there we go, Sean Tan, that's his name. He is not published by Macmillan, but, um, and he's based in Australia and published by an Australian, um, Australian publisher. And um, he does, he, he creates fantastic picture books. I have written about him on my blog, so if you just look for Sean Tan on my blog, you can see some of the things there. Okay, any more questions? Can it be prepared by children as an independent work? Do you mean, um, can children just look at the picture book? If, if that's what you mean, yes, of course they can. If you can leave these picture books in libraries and just let children browse, that's wonderful. But um, it's also nice to share a picture book with children and read it with them. Comics would be good too. Yes, you're right. And there are many comics that have become graphic novels or, or, or picture books that use comic style, which are also nice to, to share with children, yeah. Any tips on pre-reading activities? Well, um, pre-reading in the sense, the shared reading, where you're reading to children, asking them questions to arouse their curiosity. Um, if you feel that it's, you're reading a picture book which they know very little about in terms of content or the theme, then you might want to think about um, either doing something in that um, theme first before you read it, or just asking them what they think about certain things related to the theme within the picture book just reminding them of some of the words that they knew uh, so that they could use these words to um, help them understand what they were seeing and hearing as you were sharing the picture book. 
Um, there are, um, just as you would prepare any lesson which is introducing language, if you wanted to, you could do that. But don't spoil a picture book. Don't teach them everything they need to know because they don't need to know everything that they that they hear in the picture book, in the picture book verbal text. If the words if the words are supported by the pictures to a certain extent, that will help them understand. And it's important also that they are challenged, so that they are challenged to look and try and understand what they're hearing with what they're seeing. So don't give them everything. Okay. Any questions? Any tips on telling the Gruffalo to very young learners? Uh, the Gruffalo. Well, the Gruffalo is one of those picture books which is used a lot in primary because it's at the simple end of the picture word dynamic. Um, it has a very repetitive rhyming um, text, so the children pick it up very easily and they enjoy chanting with you. Um, and the illustrations support the words almost totally. So um, it's normally used with eight or nine year olds, seven, eight or nine year olds, uh, who are, and specifically because of the body parts that it contains when they're doing the body parts and colors in, in English. Um, normally it's a book that you would use at the end of, of a unit of work about body parts, so it would give them an opportunity to contextualize some of the, um, of the, of the language that they're hearing and the things that they're seeing. And you can, um, and in a way, that's a preparation for the picture book. Um, and you have lots of fun with the song, which you can get online, uh, which is sung by Julia Donaldson. And um, there are some activities on Julia Donaldson's website. If you just Google Julia Donaldson, <coughs> you can come up with um, activities for the Gruffalo. There's probably a lot online for the Gruffalo because it's a very popular book for ELT. Um, another question: Could it be useful creating picture? Whoops, gone. <laughs> Could it be useful creating picture book as a whole class using previously introduced vocabulary structures? So, yes, you would share a picture book with a whole class of students. Um, possibly, if if the book was a, to do with a theme that you've just been working with, you would use that. Um, to as a, as a nice way for the children to contextualize what they've been learning and possibly extend it as well. I think if that's what your question is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I work with the university students and Ms. Governor has given me the idea of asking my students to create their own picture books. Yes, but do expose them to pi real picture books as well so that they get an idea of how they work because the more they understand how a picture books works, the easier they will be able to create their own. Um, the idea of having um, an illustration on the title page, a dedication, um, what do they put on the cover and how does that relate to what goes on inside. So yeah, definitely. And if they do create their own picture books, get them to share them with um, children to see what the children think. Okay. So I have a question here which is, don't you think this is too much for them? Um, you have to be a bit more specific. <laughs> Um, do you mean too much of the students making the picture books? Don't know. Any other questions? I think. Ah. <coughs> Are books like Quiet and Loud by Delia Pritchett that don't really tell a story considered picture books? Yes, they were concept picture books and um, very lovely for. Um, preschool children in particular. Um, I think that we should be challenging our primary students a little bit more. So they need more than just words and pictures. They, you know, a word which represents a picture, a concept, like big, and a picture of something big and small, and a picture of something small. So you need to be looking at um, possibly more narrative-based or even non non-fiction picture books. Um, and there's a someone asked about webinars on this topic. Carol Reed, there's a webinar by Carol Reed on Miss Macmillan. Um, webinar series, um, which talks about using um, non using picture books in um, CLIL um, lessons. So you might want to visit that, which is really good too. Are you a teacher in EF? Is that a question for me? English as a foreign language? 
if you yes, I teach English in Portugal as a foreign language, and most of our students have an hour a week or or 90 minutes a week of English, so not very much really. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I can't share the slides precisely because it has the picture book scans on.